What's good with the YouTube? You already know Big Flocker with the Convicts Perspective. And I'm going to smash, dash, and slide on through with that little bit of energy. Please hit the like, subscribe, comment, do all those things to help support this channel. And hit that bell notification for future, future fire content. Check this out. We got a good one today, man. Um, I was doing a little bit of research um, into the MS-13 Mexican Mafia conflict, right? As we all know, in, in Beaumont, there was that, Beaumont, excuse me, there was that killing that happened, what was it, a year ago? It set a lot of things in place, man. But in me doing some research, one, I found out that there was another killing that happened in, uh, I think it was Virginia in 2020, where, let me put their names out there too. A lot of this stuff, I'm going to be going through records, right? Um, an inmate named uh, Morris Alexis Flores was sentenced to 15 years for, uh, for conspiring to murder fellow inmate, attempting to commit murder and being an inmate in possession of, a, of an assault weapon. Florida, Flores is an inmate in the U.S. Penitentiary of Lee County, okay? Basically, they were conspiring to kill a Mexican Mafia member, okay? They ended up shaking this dude, and they had all kinds of people come from the side and so forth. They protect him, you know what I mean? Now, there was another uh, stabbing that happened, I think, in 2018, I believe it was, in out there in New York. Um, but this led to them separating um, a lot of the MS-13 and Southsiders and inmates. So this uh, little conflict has been going on for a long time, man. There's been a lot of stabbings that have happened. And I found, and, and come across doing all this research, I came across this article that's really long, but it's really in, in depth into details, man. And it goes into everything revolving around um, the MA, MS-13 and whatnot, the relationships, right? And I figured that this one is so, such details, right? And it's really interesting that it's worth reading. You know what I'm saying? I try not to read stuff. I try to go off the top of the head. And when I investigate things, but this article, I'm going to read this one, man. This one is a good one. It, it goes into everything. And it's called uh, Mula, the bridge between MS-13 and the Mexican Mafia in T Tijuana, Mexico. Okay, this is how it starts, guys. One afternoon in 1993, Nelson Alexander Flores Pacheco, better known as Mula, within the MS-13, took his knife, stabbed a taxi driver, and kicked his face repeatedly. Just 22 years old and utterly reckless, he had assaulted the driver while intoxicated. After being arrested by Nevada police, he identified himself as a soldier within the Mara Sava Trusha. Nobody, nobody there had heard of the gang, so he self-admitted himself. Neither jail nor time cured Flores of his violent ways. Two years later, he was arrested in Nevada for participating in a drive-by shooting targeting rival members. He spent five years in prison and then was deported back to El Salvador. This was a homecoming of sorts for Flores. He was born in El Salvador, Western Department of Santa Ana, June 26, 1971. A few years before the country's civil war began, the, this conflict, which was from 1979 to 1992, this conflict marked Flores for life. Two of his sisters were killed during a guerrilla attack on a bus while his mother was killed after being caught in the crossfire. He would later tell an Ohio court. During his childhood, he helped his father in the fields after attending school until the war forced him to flee to Reno, Nevada in 1987. In Reno, he lived with his brother and began forging a reputation for violence before joining the Parkview Locos Clica of the MS-13 in Los Angeles in the early 1990s. After serving his sentence in Nevada and being re repatriated, Flores returned to the United States through Tijuana because it is so close to Los Angeles. The Mexican border city had become a destination for many gang members seeking to return to the United States after being deported. But Flores settled in Columbus, Ohio. There he started creating a new MS-13 clique, the first in the entire state. It was in the early 2000s. There was no clica said Cheka, a former gang member or homeboy, as they like to call themselves. There was only three of us, and I actually went to find one of the old-timers. They called him Mula. Cheka had gang experience on the streets of El Salvador, and Flores had spent some time in the Nevada prison system, so the two men had the chops to create their own clica, which they named the Columbus Criminals Locos after their adopted city. The MS-13's expansion into Ohio broadened the gang's presence in the United States and consequently the range of crimes they committed. Part of their profits went to El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. 
Guatemala. Like many gang members, Flores had a double life. He had a day job, often using fake documents to obscure his past, and he kept himself as he kept to himself. He was polite, respectful, and a punctual employee, according to the former contractor. However, Flores' facade, 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 excuse me, facade fell apart on December 23rd, 2004, when the Columbus police arrested him for a minor traffic accident. During the investigation, the officers discovered his true identity, and he was handed over to immigration authorities who charged him with illegal reentry. He was sentenced to 71 months in prison and sent to Inglewood Eagle, Prison in Colorado before being transferred to Big Sandy in Kentucky. Mula was behind bars again, but his criminal career was about to take off. The Rise of Mula At Big Sandy, Flores met Jose Landa Rodriguez, a.k.a. Fox, a respected gang member who became a member of the Mexican Mafia, or M.A. in jail. Known as Carnales, or Soul Brothers, <laughs> I never heard no Soul Brothers, there are about a handful of M.A. inside some of the federal and state prisons. They wielded tremendous influence over other gang members. The M.A. got a start in California where inside the state prison system, they created a confederation of Latino gangs. This was to ensure these gangs did not attack each other inside the penitentiary system if they were enemies on the outside. The non-aggression pact took on a name, Sul or South. This is, a lot of this information is not accurate, guys, as you guys know. M.A. formed to be a powerful group, you know what I'm saying, to pretty much fucking run shit and fucking reign terror <laughs> in the system. Um, and the Sulano part didn't come until later. It eventually grew to include tens of thousands of members across the United States. At the top, of course, was the Mexican Mafia, whose members were often referred to as Los Senores and used the gang for its own criminal ends. Rodriguez, for example, had an entourage of Sudanos who obeyed him at will outside the prison. In addition, the MA leader who had who held for the Mexican state of Mitchell Khan had ties to prominent Mexican drug traffickers. As a young man in the early 1990s, he was connected with the Montes family, the main drug trafficking con contact in California for Mexican criminal groups like the Familia, Familia Mitchell Khan and the Knights Templar. In 2001, the Montes family put Rodriguez in charge of trafficking methamphetamine and marijuana from the Mitchell Khan to the United States. This created a long-standing partnership between the M.A. and Knights Templar. While in prison, Flores and Rodriguez quickly formed a deep bond. Flores convinced Rodriguez that the MS-13 didn't sell out to its people or surrender. It wasn't long before Flores won over Rodriguez, and he soon became a spokesperson for the M.A. He'd make calls to members in other prisons and speak with contacts on the outside and conversations that involved more than just drug deals. Flores' notoriety had been growing among MS-13 members in Columbus due to his bravery and leadership, but he hadn't quite caught the gang's attention across the United States. His ar arrest was a turning point. Once inside the prison system, he gained relevance, power, and fame. Eventually, his name started to resonate in Big Sandy and across the country. His fellow MMS-13 members knew he was also working as a soldier for the Yemen and that his contacts with other criminal networks were becoming more frequent. His bond with Rodriguez was such that he even, be he even became a prospective Garnan. Before Flores was released, Rodriguez saw how their new relationship could help the Yemen on the streets. He entrusted Flores to manage the Yemen's drug trafficking operations in the United States. At some point, the two decided Flores should settle down in Tijuana. They'd meet again in Mexico as soon as Rodriguez was released. Well, far, this is pretty interesting, I see. After completing his big his sentence at Big Sandy in January 2011, Flores was deported to El Salvador according to confidential intelligence documents from El Salvador National Civil Police. The documents was obtained by DDU Secrets, an organization that received leaked documents from a hacking group called Guacamaya. With Rodriguez's support and his future in said Tijuana, Flores didn't stay in El Salvador for long. He left soon after arriving with the help of MA Secretary in Southern California, who assisted him during the almost three-week trip north. Tijuana was a perfect base for Flores. The border city is home to drug traffickers, smugglers, fugitives, human traffickers, and many others engaged in criminal activity. Some call it the city of sin, so it's easy for Flores to blend in. What's more, it was a regular respite for his gang. MS-13 members have passed through Tijuana since the gang first formed in Los Angeles in the mid-1980s back then. 
Central American gang members would even pose as Mexicans. They're not all from MS-13, but from any gang. Sankuna was one of the first Mexicans to be accepted in the MS-13. Tijuana became a neutral spot where various gang members could coexist. In a way, it felt like the extension of the M.A. Su philosophy that had spread throughout California's prison system. The border city also served the M.A.'s drug trafficking interest. A portion of drug shipments traveling through Mexico crosses the border in Tijuana to reach U.S. consumers. But for that to happen, traffickers needed intermediaries that could maneuver the legal and illegal border crossings. The M.A. was effective in that role. It didn't control any unlike in the United States, but unlike in the United States, it didn't control any territory. Its members transferred drugs across the border or worked as hired gunmen. In other words, they, they are service to Mexico's, Mexico's well-established drug trafficking networks. Despite its long-standing presence, the MS-13 was never able to establish a foothold in Tijuana. With a mix of members primarily composed of deportees from different U.S.-based clicas, MS-13 members in TJ simply worked to survive or pass through the city. As such, MS-13 gang members in TJ can be divided into two categories. The quiet ones looking for nothing more than a place to settle down after years of imprisonment, or the active ones moving drugs across the border or offering their services as hit men. Flores became one of the active ones. Upon arriving, Robert Reese, also known as Peanut Butter, and a longtime Emmy member, welcomed Flores with an open arms. Reese, who was close with Flores, Big, Big Sandy Mentor Rodriguez also connected Flores with the best paying drug traffickers in Mexico. At first, this meant the Knights nice Templar, a powerful group that had emerged from the rem remnants of the Familia Michoacana, later he would explain. In addition, Flores' relationship with Rodriguez continued. The two kept in touch by phone even after Rodriguez was transferred from Big Sandy to the county jail in Los Angeles. The conversations, many of which were intercepted by U.S. Justice Department's were full of coded messages about drugs, politics, and loyalty to brotherhood. Rodri Flores and Rodriguez also discussed plans to work with the Knights Templar in Los Angeles. Over time, Flores' ambition grew. He began to work with whoever paid the best. According to a Yako, a gang member, who knew Flores well but asked for his identity to be withheld for security reasons, Flores went on to become a hitman for the Knights Templar, according to U.S. federal prison officials who spoke to incite crime on condition of anonymity. He also trafficked in methamphetamine to various U.S. cities and even dealt with the Sinaloa. With time, Flores' revenues grew and he invested in a chain of small convenience stores called Tecate 6. Throughout the, this, he maintained contact with the MS-13. He gave gang members jobs at his stores or provided a place to stay. Like he had in Ohio, Flores led a double life. While he used his MA connections to expand his criminal activity, he became widely respected within the MS-13 as somebody who looked out for his homeboys. Flores also kept the original MS-13 clique out close. For instance, he made sure to send money to the Park U Locals leader back in Los Angeles. And when he needed a right-hand man he could count on in Tijuana, he turned to another homie, Jose Alberto Alvarado Molina, alias Guadas. Molina, who would later be investigated by Interpol, for drug trafficking and murder was famous for his rap songs about the MS-13 and had been one of the first to work for Flores at one of the, his Tecate 6 locations. Still, Flores had his own contradictions. Despite his own criminal activities, for example, Flores told the other homeboys who came to, to him for support that he that the gang was not allowed to sell drugs or, cor, or carry out robberies in TJ because the city was not the territory of the MS-13 nor the Sureños. Flores kept making money and rising in stature. It wasn't long before he owned two taxis and four Tecate 6 stores. After the arrest of several important MS-13 leaders in Los Angeles, Flores became the de facto leader of the gang in the city. According to Yako, Flores spent two years overseeing gang operations between TJ and Los Angeles. One example of the small-scale logistic networks Flores ran across the United States emerged in the federal indictment filed in 2015. Prosecutors accused Flores of connecting methamphetamine dealers to one of his homeboys in a state prison in California. The homeboy using a contraband cell arranged for drug-filled stuffed animals to be sent to Oklahoma and Arkansas. Overall, prosecutors said Flores arranged for an estimated 10,000 grams of methamphetamine to be distributed to Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and New York. Money was sent to MS-13's top leadership in El Salvador, known as the Rafa Nacion and used to purchase weapons, according to Salvadoran prosecutors. 
In trade, the Rothschild want to take things further. Marlon Antonio Menjivia Portillo, alias Rojo, a Rothschild member based in Mexico who is close to Flores, proposed that all the homies in Tijuana should run under the Mexico program. The program was an extension of the Rothschild's leadership, and doing so would mean that the, every MS-13 member in Mexico was controlled by El Salvador. Flores responded with a resounding no. It was the clearest signal yet of where his allegiance stood. As a soldier of the MA, he could not allow the MS-13 or any gang on that on the border, for that matter, to establish itself in TJ. The Sioux philosophy that kept the peace between the gangs had to be maintained, he reasoned. But Menjivar wouldn't let it go. He contacted Flores again to suggest that any MS-13 members buying and selling drugs in Mexico should operate under the single chain of command directed by the Rafla in El Salvador. Flores was, was surprised by his assistance, but decided to meet him halfway. He said he could help the Rafla find cheaper suppliers, but nothing more. While he had no intentions of going against the, his Salvadorian counterparts, he explained that he was dedicating his time to the Emmy. The Rafla fell silent. Nobody followed up on it. MS-13 infighting. Flores' chest, arms, and legs are covered in tattoos, and his loyalties are clear. He has the number 13 on his chest to show his allegiance to the M.A. and the Sioux philosophy. Tucked inside the number, the letters M.S. represent his gang affiliation. On his upper back, the word Sureño stretches from shoulder to shoulder above a large M.S. that covers the rest of his back. From his tattoo, his refusal to help, help the M.S. 13 expand its drug trafficking in Tijuana, the gang didn't appreciate Flores had prioritized his affiliation. It was as if the M.A. always superseded the MS-13. In spite of his generosity toward fellow MS-13 members, the idea that he was more committed to the M.A. than his original gang and raised some homeboys who accused him of prioritizing his personal business over the gang or what they refer to as the Vario. This is pretty good, huh? When you become too involved with the M.A. and the drug trade, your body is, your Vario is regulated to the back burner and you lose sight of the original purpose, said a deported gang member. Other homeboys also saw Flores' business as acting against the interests of the MS-13. Juan Ramon Sendejas Aguirre, alias Moro, was one of them. Sendejas had been in Tijuana for a couple years after being deported from Los Angeles. He claimed to make a living by stealing drugs from small-time drug dealers. Flores had a cordial relationship with Sendejas when he arrived in TJ, but over time their friendship fell apart. Sendejas started bad-mouthing Flores to homeboys who worked for him. Perhaps because he felt Flores had betrayed the MS-13 or maybe just out of spite. Specifically, he claimed the MS-13 members, Flores, were only given the most demeaning tasks while working at his Tecate 6 stores. Tension reached a breaking point in 2015 when three hooded men wearing ski masks and brandishing guns entered a Tecate 6 where Flores' wife had been working. They gagged her, tied her up, and took about 60,000 pesos, around $3,000. Later, analyzing the clothing and build of the assailants, Flora was able to identify one of the assailants as Hen Hensi, a Salvadoran gang member who had been deported from California. Flores was incensed. He knew Hensi was very close to Sendejas. What's more assaulting, his wife was a grave was a grave offense that demanded immediate retribution. During a subsequent meeting between the gang members, Molina, Flores' right hand man, demanded Hensi be handed over within a week. Sendejas reportedly agreed. But days, weeks, and months went by and Hensi never appeared. Flores and his allies began looking for him. They spent several nights driving around Hensi's neighborhood, but Hensi was nowhere to be found. Things cooled down until one day, Sedeas called Flores and told him he was going to for tacos with Hensi and his wife. On the phone, he promised to call later with the exact location. The account gets fuzzy at this stage, but according to Yako, Flores got in contact with a hitman for the Jalisco New Generation. He was taking no chances. When Sendejas, Hennessy, and his wife arrived at the restaurant, they got out of the car and walked in. At some point, according to Yako, Sendejas went to the bathroom and called Flores. Hennessy overheard the call. Without a word, Hennessy went to his car, opened the trunk, and took out some gasoline containers. When Sendejas went to see what he was doing, he told him he needed to get gas and then hopped into the taxi. But instead of going to a gas station, Hennessy went to a friend's. There, he left his wife and, and a Borrowed a mini Uzi. By the time he returned to the restaurant, the CJNG hitmen and Sedeas were back in the restaurant. Shots were fired and Sedeas collapsed, bleeding profusely. They got Moro, shouted the hitman, referring to Sedeas. Sedeas had 13 bullet wounds but survived. Following the shooting, Hensi requested a meeting with Flores. 
There he came clean about participating in the Takati 6 robbery. He said he only did it because Sedehaus, who had also been a part of the Basque assailants who attacked Flores' wife, convinced him to participate. These guys were cutthroat. Flores was stunned into placate Flores, hence he vowed he'd kill Sedehaus, but he never got the chance. Drug traffickers killed Hensi in Tijuana in September 2016, seven years after the Taco Stand incident. Sedeas was also shot and killed in his apartment in TJ. Fellow gang members emptied an entire clip into his head. Man, this is crazy. Flores, criminal career in TJ, was driving in the U.S. Um, Federal Bureau of Investigation and heard his name on a wiretap. At the time, the agency was investigating a series of homicides between 2013 and 2015 by the Parkview locals in L.A. The case led to a U.S. indictment in March 5th of 2018. Flores was arrested in TJ in one of his Tecate 6 stores, the so-called high-level security groups. Grupos de Alto Nievo de Seguridad Genseg, formed by the governments of El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico, aided his capture. He was accused of conspiracy in Southern District of Ohio. U.S. authorities eagerly awaited Flores extra, being extradited, but it never came. According to Salvadoran intelligence reports, Flores was detained in Mexico for only 11 days before being sent to El Salvador in March of 2018. His swift deportation raised red flags. Some of his fellow gang members believed he had bribed Mexican authorities. Yako, for example, said Flores knew of the U.S. extradition request and paid to expedite his repatriation. Two months later, the U.S. government requested that Interpol issue a red notice for his arrest. In November 2018, just six months after being deported, Flores returned once again to TJ. These guys were off the fucking hook, man. Eager to resume his criminal activity. He continued to lead his double life, working with the MA, and sent kilograms of methamphetamine to the United States while also sheltering MS-13 homeboys. The FBI investigator revealed that he used the alias 40, or Wana. But during his second stay in TJ, against the Mexican program boiled over, he was convinced that Menjivar, and the leader of the program, Hugo Contreras Milano's alias Flaco had handed him over to Mexican authorities. The officers who captured him told him as much according to a classified report. So basically, he got turned on by someone. Flores shared this news with one of the gang's most influential Ronfleros jailed in California who, co who coordinated a revenge attack from his cell with Hector Antonio Alfaro Flores, alias Crimen. Alfaro was in El Salvador. And prosecution there was had wiretaps his conversation as part of their own investigation. This shit's fucking crazy. Through intercepted phone calls, they discovered a plan in mid-2019 to bring homies from California to New York to TJ to assassinate certain Mexico program members. According to the document, the attack was eventually thwarted because the gang members coming from New York were arrested on drug charges. Ultimately, Flores would last less than two years in TJ before authorities tracked him down. This time they handed him over to the FBI. The rest hit us hard, an old MS-13 gay member told Inside Crime. Mula was our advisor, one who always had a solution, the one who found a way to support us no matter what. Without his help, Flores' associates couldn't visit the store where they worked and didn't know what to do. After arriving in the U.S., United States, Flores was sent to Ohio. According to the court records, he is scheduled to be released September of 30, 2024. However, that may not happen. In July 2021, just days after sentencing in Ohio, the Southern District Court picked him up for trafficking. Kind of interesting, huh? So, um, Mula, the influential, influential dude within the MS-13, this dude, it's almost like he knew how to politic, man. <laughs> um, he was able to pacify both sides. It seemed like at times he had a lot of hate on it, man, but... Um, you know, I wonder how all this is playing into part nowadays with everything that happened over there in the feds and Beaumont. I read a lot of reports. They started to separate a lot of the MS-13 before that killing. There'd been a couple other stabbings, stabbings and conspiracy for killings. And uh, the thing is about the Federal Bureau of uh, Prisons, right, or BOP, is that a lot of these, these people that were getting hit, they're labeling as MA members, which I can't confirm. Uh, but they were at least Sudanos. And so... Uh, this dude right here, I think, is kind of the is kind of key between those relationships. As you know, you have the the uh, the group over there in MS13 who want to push their own agenda, their own fucking taxes, their own fucking control of their own people. And then you got 
those that are have their allegiance to the enemy. So, uh, you know, it's kind of hard for me to kind of determine how this works because I don't know enough, man. But I've heard of it. this shit's been going on like the conflicts. It's like they have a love hate relationship where they have certain members from MS13 who are cool with, with MA, who are willing to work and are fucking soldiers and even been recruited by the MA. And you have some that were just totally against it. And it seems like there's always a power struggle. You know, no matter what, man, within any of these Latino groups, there's just a power struggle, man. It's, you know, just something that always happens no matter what, man. And once people get big in numbers, is when people's agendas change. It's, well, okay, we no longer need you. We're going to do our own fucking thing. You know, I do think that the MS-13, the national one, is a little bit more different than the ones that are California-based or more LA-based. You know, uh, in any event, man, I'm just going to leave this alone. Interesting article. Tell me what you guys think. I'm gone.